Hello, everyone. Welcome to our quarterly HA Circulation Imaging Case Webinar titled Novel Imaging Guides Patient Care. I'm Dr. Renee bullock I'm one of the section editors for Circulation Imaging Journal of the HA, and I'm a non-invasive multimodality imaging cardiologist and the director of non-invasive cardiac imaging at the Boer Heart and Lung Center in New Jersey. And today I'm joined by Dr. Ahmad Masri, who is another section editor of Circulation Imaging. And we're very happy to be joined by our group of expert panelists today, Dr. Seiji Aito, Dr. Christopher Kramer, Dr. Barry Love, and Dr. Sarab Malhotra. And uh, for today, we have three very interesting cases that were recently published in Circulation Imaging Journal of the HA. Each case will be presented by the authors, followed by a panel discussion for each case. So for our first case, it's titled Truncal Valve Repair, Three-Dimensional Imaging and Modeling to Enhance Preoperative um, pre Surgical Planning. That will be presented by Drs. Uh, Trevor Williams, Dr. Lana Sensuli, and Dr. Matthew Jolly. And for the, this case, we will have our expert panelist, uh, Dr. Saiji Aitu, who is a board certified cardiologist at Children's National in Washington, DC, who has expertise in adult congenital heart disease and pediatric cardiology. And we'll also be joined by Dr. Barry Love, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology in the Jack and Lucy Clark Department of Pediatrics at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in uh, New York City. He's a director of the Congenital Cardiac Catheterization Program at Mount Sinai, and Dr. Love holds joint appointment in both the departments of pediatrics and, and internal medicine, and is one of only a few physicians who performs interventional procedures on patients with congenital heart disease from infancy through to adulthood. He's board certified in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, and adult congenital heart disease. So with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Trevor Williams to start his case presentation. So th thank you, Renee. I'm just going to do a quick uh, audio and visual check here to make sure that you can uh, see the slides. Are you able to see those appropriately? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, welcome. Thank you, Renee. And um, uh, thank you all really for this invitation on behalf of the American Heart Association to highlight efforts to individualize the care of children with heart disease by leveraging three-dimensional imaging and modeling to enhance perioperative surgical planning. In December of 2022 in circulation cardiovascular imaging, we described the novel application of multimodality imaging techniques and parameterization in the case of a 13-year-old male with a history of truncus arteriosus with moderate truncal valve insufficiency. We underwent neonatal repair with VSD closure, truncal valve annuloplasty, and placement of a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. Serial imaging demonstrated truncal insufficiency that advanced from mild to moderate to moderate to severe with a regurgitant fraction of 55% by MRI and progression of LV dilation. The patient was referred for surgical intervention with anticipated truncal valve replacement with a prosthetic valve and root sparing ascending aortograft. So depicted here are clips from the preoperative imaging of the truncal valve. In A is a three-dimensional echocardiographic image of the truncal valve in diastole uh, which demonstrates a central coaptation defect. In B is a 3D echocardiographic image of the truncal valve in systole demonstrating limited leaflet excursion. In C, a short axis 2D color Doppler image in diastole showing primarily central regurgitation, which is corroborated in a 3D color Doppler image in diastole and D. And in E, a volume rendering of a CT scan in diastole again demonstrates the central coaptation defect through another modality from a surgical view. And finally, in F, a volume rendering of the CT scan in systole shows partial leaflet fusion. Uh, so next, I'd like to play a video of the standard preoperative imaging evaluation using 2D and 3D transesophageal echocardiography for subsequent comparison with enhanced evaluation through application of the, the techniques previously discussed. Uh, so here, the short axis view demonstrates moderate to severe truncal valve insufficiency occurring through a central coaptation defect. In the long axis view, there's evidence of leaflet prolapse, suggesting the mechanism of insufficiency. With a 3D view from above the level of the truncal valve, there's evidence of partial fusion of the posterior leaflets. And then as we'll see with color, regurgitation occurs through a central coaptation defect with a second jet apparent through a likely fenestration. And then finally, as we'll see in just a moment, with standard multiplanar reconstruction of a 4D CT scan, those previously mentioned findings are redemonstrated. 
So now let's add the benefit of image-derived modeling and enhanced surgical planning capabilities using Slicer Heart, which is a software platform developed in the Jolly Laboratory and leveraged by the Valve Center team at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to inform the trunk repair. The retrospectively gated CT demonstrated a quadricuspid truncal valve with incomplete apposition of the valve leaflets during diastole. The slicer heart extension for 3D slicer was used to perform post-processing morphologic analysis, including volume rendering and focus segmentation of the truncal valve. Measurements of truncal valve dimensions were performed in a manner analogous to that described previously by Elaine Baribi et al. for the aortic valve. And then visualization uh, demonstrated normal commissural post heights of the right anterior leaflet, which would ultimately serve as the reference leaflet, and then three separate symmetrically deficient leaflets with partial fusion of the commissure between the right posterior and left posterior leaflets. Measurements of the geometric height and effective height demonstrated relative deficiency of the left anterior leaflet and reduced but equal effective heights of the left anterior, left posterior, and right posterior leaflets. And modeling demonstrated relative prolapse of the deficient valve leaflets below the level of the annular plane, resulting in regurgitation through a central coaptation defect. The left anterior leaflet was additionally noted to be retracted, highly irregular, and had a fenestration adjacent to the left anterior posterior commissure through which regurgitation occurred. So the patient underwent truncal valve repair with an RV to PA conduit replacement and right pulmonary arterioplasty. Intraoperative inspection confirmed the decision to proceed with bicuspidization of the truncal valve with preservation of the normal right anterior leaflet and closure of residual commissures between the remaining leaflets. The central area of deficiency between these leaflets was plicated with interrupted sutures. And then a patch of pericardium was used to repair the fenestration within the left anterior leaflet. The remaining aspects of the coaptation between the left anterior and left posterior leaflets were closed, yielding a functionally bicuspid valve with adequate coaptation height and excursion. One more video I'd like to share here to highlight the repair, which I think speaks for itself. So by using a custom workflow involving 3D image volume rendering and segmentation to define quantitative metrics, analogous to those used in aortic valve surgical planning in adults, our understanding of the valve geometry and mechanism of dysfunction was enhanced relative to multiplanar reconstruction alone and ultimately informed the decisions leading to a successful short-term result through bicuspidization. In the future, we hope to incorporate these tools into a flexible 3D image drive workflow to allow semi-automatic measurement of valves, editing of the valve leaflets, annuli, and roots to perform virtual surgery and ultimately generate a template for the planned result. So I'd like to close with acknowledgements for the impressive collaboration of individuals whose creativity and commitment have culminated in this work and extend a special thanks to Dr. Matthew Jolly and Alana Chinchuli, who've been instrumental in its realization. Thanks, thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity to share. Great. Thank you so much for that very excellent case presentation and the use of really advanced uh, technology to guide um, surgical management of this case. So I'll open this up um, to our ACHE experts, Dr. Barry Love and Dr. Seiji Aito. So Dr. Love, what are your thoughts on this case? So Trevor, that was a great presentation. Really, I uh, really enjoyed it. I mean, the images are beautiful and you know, the way that you're able to demonstrate the deficiency and the mechanism of the deficiency is, uh, is, really, is really clever and really interesting. So I guess my first question for you is, is, what do your surgeons think about this in the sense that you can show them all this and stuff at conference? Do they say, yeah, thanks, but they just get in there and they do what they wanna do anyways? Or do you think that this has really made a difference in terms of, uh, in terms of how they think about this um, go going into the case. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Love, and a really thoughtful question. I think the the adoption of this was really accelerated by the development in uh, 2019 of a pediatric heart valve center, which was kind of the first of its kind at the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. That really brought together a collaborative group of uh, pediatric heart surgeons, pediatric cardiologists, sonographers, research assistants, along with uh, coders and engineers as well, into a whole group focused on this particular effort. I think the, the adoption was kind of proof is in the pudding. What we ultimately found is we kind of prospectively modeled a few of these valves and then uh, the surgical department, uh, John, 
Chair Jonathan Chen, and then another um, colleague who is uh, particularly taken to this uh, methodology for approaching the valves, Dr. Mohammed Nuri, and are both members of the valve teeth themselves, I think have found it fruitful and ultimately uh, have appreciated that the what we're demonstrating by this analysis has, has kind of borne out at the time of their surgical inspection. And then it's really through that kind of group collaboration where we kind of circle back around as a team, typically twice a month or so, and review those particular cases to say, okay, what did we get right? Where were we off a little bit? And that, that, that kind of interdisciplinary uh, collaborative effort, I think, is what ultimately has bolstered the trust and the fidelity of these productions, uh, because it's very much good data in, good data out, and then there's a lot of analysis that goes into this. But ultimately, what takes this, I think, from just pretty pictures to really precision medicine, if you will, is our ability to kind of get it right and ultimately, uh, you know, give surgeons the best information possible heading into the procedure so that we can reduce those anesthetic and operative times and hopefully optimize, uh, optimize outcome. So th there was a bit of a learning curve up front, but I think it was ultimately through that revisiting it in a kind of uh, collaborative um, setting through the valve center that, that, uh, th that we adopted this as a, as a fairly routine methodology now, particularly in the repair of complex valves. And, and I would say equally important, um, some of the data that has come out of uh, uh, particular characteristics of the valves, things like leaflet retraction that um, are particularly difficult to repair and have high rates of recurrent uh, dysfunction in the valves. This has really been uh, a, a group-based effort, although somewhat biased, but a kind of thoughtful way to approach valves in deciding, okay, when are valves not particularly amenable to repair so that we're bringing the correct patients to the operative room uh, for repair as, oppo as opposed to replacement. And I see that uh, we're joined by Dr. Jolly and Dr. Sansuli. Did you guys have anything to add? I know it's, you guys were involved in this case. So uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. Uh, Trevor presented uh, things very nicely. Uh, I would just respond to Dr. Love's question uh, in saying within a month of developing this for research purposes, the surgeons have wanted it on almost every semilunar valve repair. So it is driven really by them. And then we've iteratively, iteratively improved our tools. So at this time, um, we're saturated by requests uh, for this modeling. And uh, as uh, Trevor said, uh, uh, somewhat victims of our own success. So that's great. We're happy to, to be helping children. That's uh, where we want to go. Um, but I do think uh, it, it's nice to be appreciated. <laughs> If I may, I can ask some comment or questions. Oh, yeah. So first, uh, I'd like to congratulate for this publication, Dr. Williams and Dr. Jolie. And I think uh, there is an emerging, you know, a need and desire to work on the uh, valve repair, uh, particularly in uh, young patients, uh, rather than doing the uh, valve replacement. So this is a very important field I acknowledge first. Uh, but I think uh, in your paper, uh, things that I want to ask you and uh, see if you have any thoughts is that, um, you know, T having TEE and uh, dynamic multiphase CT, I think they are both important and understanding the mechanism um, mechanisms of the uh, regurgitation is very important. And I wanted to see how in your uh, thinking, how T TEE and CT would complement each other uh, and which point that would be more uh, you know, valuable from each aspect. And that's one question. And the first, uh, second one is that, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, do you determine the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, getting the CT's image and the TE image, it's most important to get the good quality image, particularly you're talking about getting the CT in the younger patient who may need, you know, a beta blocker to slow down the heart rate or you know you may need to do sedation uh, for that. So, what is your institutional practice in terms of op optimizing the cardiac CT imaging in this circumstance? Perfect. Re really, really, really thoughtful uh, questions, Dr. Ido. And, uh, appreciate that. I'll I'll speak to um, the, the first one and then uh, sequentially take the second. So, your point is very well taken that it really is a multimodality effort here. Um, obviously, so there, there are benefits to each modality. So echo, obviously having great temporal resolution really helps us in children with uh, particularly fast heart rates often at the time of the imaging, whereas the spatial resolution of cross-sectional imaging is often superior. But it's really through the kind of merging the synergis, uh, synergism, if you will, of those technologies where we can 
uh, benefit from the spatial resolution of things like CT and MRI, but w inherent in those are some limitations, things like dropout, for example, of the technology, and then pairing that with 3D TEE, where we can actually assess areas suspicious for artifact to see whether there is color flow across those um, regions. That can be particularly helpful. In, in the case of this truncal valve, I think it's really only through the merging of those technologies that you're able to distinguish things like leaflet fenestration from just dropout as a lim limitation of the technology. And, um, and that can be critical to the surgeons in, in terms of their plan going in. Um, the um, in, in the second question, would you just briefly briefly Is it optimizing the CT image? Oh. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, it, this, I think it is organization through like a valve center where it actually, and, and um, it, to give some credit to Dr. Jolly, who is uh, trained as a pediatric anesthesiologist, as well as a cardiac anesthesiologist, as well as a pediatric cardiologist, they're having a multidisciplinary team there that is familiar with those concepts, like you mentioned, beta blockers or Presidex for slowing the heart rate for the patient, um, be feeling comfortable with uh, breath holds, particularly if they, they have to be prolonged and more so in the youngest of patients to really optimize that, that image quality is key. Um, and I would say without specific data to back it up that there are a number of different ways of doing these evaluations. And, and as a center, I think we've moved towards kind of prospective evaluations to allow the time for a thoughtful post-processing of this and sharing with the surgeons so that we can develop uh, a plan um, in advance of, of the surgery. So uh, we have valve center days, for example, where we have a number of individuals um, specializing in this evaluation where patients come in in a dedicated format we uh, perform the TEs, schedule the CT or MRI often with the same uh, sedation uh, for the patient. And then on the back end, typically have about one to two weeks between the time of anticipated surgery to really process that data prospectively, sit down with the surgeon, see if whether there's any additional information and parameterization that's needed from that. Um, that we can uh, help to optimize their planning going into the surgery. And um, we've kind of moved away from, I think, some of the like preoperative TEE heading into the surgery as being like the, the first evaluation in terms of reconsidering the mechanism of regurgitation head, heading into surgery. And I think that's been somewhat critical in allowing uh, us to have a, a calculated approach going into the surgery. See, thank you. I was just wondering, um, so Dr. Williams, do you guys use, um, ever use 3D printing for some of these patients? Because I know there are some institutions that are using that. And if you do, how do you choose which patients um, are suitable for that technology? Yeah, uh, in incredible question. So I think um, we've used a combination both of 3D printing and then actually of late kind of virtual reality. And because I think there, there are elements of each of those that extend beyond kind of the, the two dimensional screen, if you will, that really engagement uh, of the surgeon with the valve in the way that they're going to see it at the time of the operation uh, is, is most helpful. So I think um, we have used 3D printed models and particularly complex anatomy we, where we feel like the limitations of, of 2D have been, um, we've kind of like met, met the limit of where that's been helpful. Um, often complex spatial anatomy. So divert, to diverge a second from, from valves, things like modeling uh, complex VSDs, uh, that's been somewhat helpful. And then I think virtual reality as uh, kind of an aug augmented technology to that has essentially <laughs> taken those benefits and expanded them because you're not necessarily subject to the structural limitations of the molds with which you're constructing 3D or the materials with which you're printing in 3D. And you can actually allow the surgeons through VR on the day or the morning of a surgery to e explore that three-dimensionally to zoom in and get a sense of based on their approach, what the valve will look like from a particular angle or for example, uh, with other complex anatomies like a VSD, for example, what the VSD will look like, particularly with, uh, with challenging uh, approaches when you have trabeculations and things to contend with. So uh, I think we found those both very helpful. Uh, if I was to comment on some limitations to that, if people are thinking about um, developing programs, time is certainly one, and then spatial location uh, would be another in, do in doing that. So the, the turnaround time for these becomes critically important. Um, in making them available to the surgeons and then their ability to actually get to the model or get to the virtual reality uh, studio in time, if you will, to, to explore that can be somewhat limiting amidst everyone's busy busy schedules. But, but I, I do think there's a lot of value, value add in each of those technologies.
Do you ever use, I mean, an narcotic MRI, especially for children who are concerned about radiation exposure? So is there any role in this particular case where a cardiac MRI could have been helpful or would do, I mean, CT has very good spatial resolution, which MRI doesn't have. So um, what are your thoughts on that? It's a good question. I uh, So I think we have used MRI with this, and I would say MRI in a lot of ways ends up closer to CD, CT and the fidelity of the models that we're generating as relative to echo. Um, uh, so in those children who have needed MRI for other reasons and are undergoing sedation for, for that, for example, if we're deciding whether to intervene on an aortic valve with aortic valve regurgitation and people are very interested in uh, a specific and, and reliable assessment of LV volume and the patients undergoing an MRI will often um, meet proactively and put in a particular order that allows us to get the valve specific information that's needed at the time of that study as well to consolidate sedation for a patient. Um, along this line, there's a technology that I imagine many here are more familiar even than myself with, but things like a photon scanner, uh, where we're reducing the radiation capacity of things like CT, but getting increasingly uh, better spatial resolution in that regard. And in that with faster acquisition times, lower radiation, and um, even higher resolution, I think is really going to catapult the, the field of, of valve imaging and valve analysis and, and really structural intervention uh, moving forward. So big capital investments for institutions, but I, I think it will pay off and at some point hopefully becomes kind of the, the standard of care in these evaluations. All right. So we have one minute left. So Dr. Love, any final thoughts before we move to the next case? Thanks. I, I guess all that I would say is, is that, you know, this is this is really great work. You know, for a patient like this who's 13 with uh, with truncal regurgitation, you're really left with not very many options. You know, the, obviously the ROS is off the table in a patient like this. And to use a mechanical valve, you know, the, the replacement options, uh, again, obviously a, a, a bioprosthetic valve is not ideal in a 13-year-old and a mechanical valve has, has, uh, has many drawbacks. And so you're really left with not a lot of options. And so if you can affect a, a good repair, um, that's obviously really very critical. And so I congratulate you on this, uh, on using this technology to hopefully get better surgical results uh, because it's clearly needed, especially in this, uh, in this uh, patient group. Great. Thank you so much to the presenters and our expert panel. Uh, so Dr. Maggi, over to you for the second case. Thank you. Great, thank you. That was phenomenal. And continuing along the same lines, we'll be we'll talk about a, another case um, uh, that used uh, imaging to guide intervention. Uh, just first of all, I'll introduce the rest of our uh, panelists here. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kramer, uh, who is the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Virginia. Um, he is a world-renowned expert in cardiac MRI, as well as uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We're happy to have him here with us today. Um, and then Dr. Surab Malhotra, who is the director of the Advanced Cardiac Imaging at Cook County Health uh, and also an associate professor of medicine at Rush Medical College in Chicago. He is also uh, an amyloid expert and uh, a nuclear as well as multimodality imaging. So we're very happy to have you both with us. So for the second case, it's um, somewhat unusual. Uh, it uses uh, 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 a Voronoi diagram guided septal ablation for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is for how to guide alcohol septal ablation and get uh, optimal results. And so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Tirushi Yutani, who is a cardiologist at Ahimi University Graduate School of Medicine in Japan. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to him where he provided us with a pre recorded. Uh, uh, audio uh, presentation, uh, as well as followed by the discussion uh, as well. So uh, we'll get this up and going right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Terio Shiwetani from Japan. Thank you very much for this honored opportunity. Today, I'd like to talk about the usefulness of a Voronoi diagram guided septal ablation for patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I have no financial relationships to disclose. What do you all think is the key to optimal PTSM for HOCM? Today's presentation may provide a clue to that. First of all, I'd like to provide you with a small explanation regarding the Volumen diagram. 
It is a mathematical algorithm to divide an area or space close to each of a given set of objects, such as points or lines. In medicine, this algorithm can divide organ sections by separate blood supply by subconstructing surfaces uh, representing the shortest bisexuals between vessels. Also, it can be applied to the relationship between coronary arteries and the corresponding myocardial perfusion areas in the cardiovascular field. We have reported on the myocardial area at risk (MAR) using cardiac CT and Bolognoi algorithm-based myocardial segmentation. We are also interested in further application of this method to PTSMA. This slide shows case one. A male in his 60s was diagnosed with drug refractory HOCM and referred to our hospital for PTSMA. The right panel shows that asymmetrical septal hypertrophy and systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve concomitant with mitral regurgitation in cardiac MRI. The left and middle panels show that the Volnoy diagram algorithm in cardiac CT estimated that the myocardial perfusion volume in first septal branch S1, S2, and S3 were 5.7%, 0.5%, and 1.6% of the LV myocardium, respectively, and that S1 and S3 were the primary features of the basal septum. Based on the CT based myocardial segmentation, we performed the PTSMA to the first and third septal branches. The lower panel shows that the interventricular peak pressure gradient dramatically decreased after the first and third branch ablation. Case 2 is default case for PTSMA. A male in his 50s was also diagnosed with drug refractory HOCM. The Bolognoi diagram algorithm in cardiac CT estimated that the myocardial perfusion volume in the first septal branch was 17% of the LV myocardium. An invasive coronary angiogram confirmed an s derived large myocardial perfusion area. Our heart team concluded that the surgical myectomy was preferable to PTSMA to avoid procedural complications. Such as these two cases, there were cases in which CT guided treatment is effective. However, we should be careful not to over rely on a single test. Case 3 is an educational pitfall case for our case series. The Bolognoi diagram in cardiac CT estimates that the third septal branch was the main artery corresponding to the basal septum of the LV myocardium. Therefore, we thought it would work to treat only S3. Based on the CT analysis, we first performed ethanol injection into the sub branch of the third septal artery, S3A. However, immediately after the alcohol abrasion, the patient presented pressure shock status and the interventricular peak pressure gradient increased. Fortunately, she recovered from pressure shock status after additional abrasion to the first septal branch, which surprised the myocardium in the most basal part. We speculated that pressure shock status may have developed because of hyperkinetic wall motion as a residual basal septum responsible for the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This slide shows a take-home message on optimizing PTSMA for HOCM. Detecting septal branches to hypertrophic myocardium causing the LV outflow tract obstruction is crucial using cardiac CT and invasive coronary angiography. The Voronoi diagram-based myocardium segmentation, according to the coronary artery, is promising. It allows for 1. Proper situation selection, 2. Visualization of the target septal branches and LV myocardium, 3. Precise procedure, and 4. Evaluation of the therapeutic effect. In conclusion, I'd like to say that Voronoi diagram guided amazing may result in more promising and stable outcomes following PTSMA than traditional approaches. Thank you very much for your attention. This is great. Uh, we'll hold on on the live discussion just for a minute. Uh, we should still uh, go ahead and play uh, the pre-taped uh, audio discussion as well, um, if it's available.
Good. And then we'll have a live discussion after. Thank you for your question. The first question is, given the challenges associated with the current standard techniques for identifying target receptor branches in patients with HOCM, I would appreciate it if we could elucidate the advantage of employing the proposed approach utilizing Boronoi diagrams. In response to your first question, current standard method cannot accurately identify hypertrophic myocardium that contribute to the LV outflow tract obstruction, nor can they quantify the amount of myocardium pathways by the septal branch. This approach has several advantages. First, Voronoi diagram based myocardial segmentation can elucidate individual coronary arteries and the corresponding myocardial perfusion areas. This approach could avoid excessive aberration, which is expected shorten procedure time and reduce complications. With more data in the future, uh, it may be possible to calculate specific cutoff value for the amount of myocardium to be aberrated, and that for required dose of ethanol. Second, this new approach could easily evaluate target receptor branch candidates using cardiac CT three-dimensionally. We experienced several cases, such as the case with the receptor branch originating from the diagonal branch and the terrification crisis with the receptor branch originating from the ramus intermediates between the RAD and the CX. These cases may be challenging for a standard approach. Second question is, what obstructs might rise when implementing this approach in routine clinical cases? In response to this, in procedural planning, as shown as case 3, it is also essential to comprehensively evaluate the geometry of hypertrophic myocardium and hemodynamics causing the LV outflow obstruction to determine the target vessels for PTSMA. Our proposal approach necessitates requires to obtain high quality cardiac CT images with a standard MDCT system. Retrospective ACCKD scanning in cases of sinus rhythm is better, and mid diastolic images that are advantageous for delineating the coronary arteries. These are also essential items for cardiac CT imaging. All we have to do is carefully search and track as many sectoral branches as it possible in the CT images. Great. Um, to me, this is fascinating in the sense of you are trying to create a, a, a way of um, going into the procedure, having you know some understanding of what you want to achieve. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Kramer. Um, you know, and instead of a kind of a, a Q and A approach, more or less to see. What are your thoughts about this and how do you think this, you know, relates to how we normally would do alcohol septal ablation or PTSMA and whatnot? Yeah, I, I thank Dr. Utani for an excellent presentation and discussion. Uh, very interesting uh, concept. I think free procedure planning is critical in, uh, in uh, alcohol septal ablation, mapping out the, the, the septal, septal artery that needs to be uh, uh, treated or more than more than one. So this is uh, you know important to approach using CT ahead of time so that the interventionalist can can plan it. Um, you know at our institution, I know at many others, uh, contrast echo is used to uh, actually intra procedurally visualize the extent of the myocardium subtended by the the uh, individual septal arteries. Um, you know one of my questions was exactly how those beautiful color-coded Voronoi diagrams are developed out of the CT, which are you know anatomic uh, uh, coronary images, and so how to match the, the the coronary anatomy with the exact portion of the the septum that will ultimately uh, be ablated. I think you know contrast echo. You're getting the direct uh, uh, visualization of the myocardium that will be affected by that septal. I think uh, by C CT there's a little bit of an extrapolation uh, from the anatomy of the, the artery to the, to the myocardium. So I'm, it would be interesting to know how the, how the two uh, uh, techniques compare directly head to head. 
Yeah, it it's, it seems it seems like you know one of the it seems like it relies on 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 you know computational segmentation. I don't know if uh, Dr. Richani have have anything to add in that you know in that regard. Um, but I think you know part of, part of the concept here is that you know you, you you know you go in to the procedure having an idea of what you want to address uh in comparison to you're on the table you're having you know cath cath lab time everybody i know gets you know frustrated sometimes you know hey you know keep going keep pushing let's get over with this soon the second thing is i wonder how aggressive would someone be if they have to engage every single uh, a septal branch first and then study it and then decide what to do. Typically, most people, uh, and would, would love to hear more about what you do, uh, Dr. Kramer, but typically most people would probably inject uh, the first branch and see uh, with echo contrast, see the supplying area and how yeah. it looks like and go there. Yeah, the first two generally are, you know, our interventionalists will uh, approach the first two and, and not beyond, won't, certainly won't inject the third or fourth septal in general. So, you know, I think CT planning can, can really help. Uh, another interesting, you know, concept going forward is that in the future, maybe we won't need to know the septal anatomy with catheter and uh, mechanical approaches for septal ablation that don't require alcohol injection down the uh, down the corner is there, there are two studies from Chinese groups, one using uh, catheter based uh, myocardial ablation and the second just published in Jack a, a couple weeks ago on uh, a mechanical sort of shaving device, a transapical and a beating heart to shave off the, the basal septum again where you don't need to understand the septal anatomy, it's more understanding the area of hypertrophy that needs to be treated. So I think the future may be that we don't need to know the septal anatomy, but I think that that is in the future for now we do. And our, our interventionalists are more, at least uh, in, in the US are more comfortable with, with alcohol septal ablation approach. But I think, you know, in 10 years, we may be doing this very differently. Great, yeah, I mean, you know, as all of you know, uh, you know, I love this space. HCM has had tremendous, uh, uh, you know, things happening in the last five to 10 years. And not just on the drug, you know, part of it also in terms of technical and approaches for even septal reduction therapy. One last quick comment before we move on to the next case. Yeah, you know, the third case looks like because the selection was to inject a lower branch before the higher S1 branch, it essentially resulted in what looks like a Takatsubo phenomena where you had actually acute worsening of your LVOT obstruction in the setting of having hypokinetic segment below it and you know uh, nicely the team there rescued the situation and moved quickly and did the s1 so that's i think a really important takeaway as well so thank you so much both dr kramer and dr tani for this presentation um we'll move next to our uh, uh third case which is another fascinating case uh it is in a a, a relatively related disease but different approach it's in uh, transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis and it's titled Gene Silencing Therapy in Variant Transthyretin Amyloid. This is a puzzling case of decreasing PYP uptake on scintigraphy. Uh, Dr. Dia Smiley is joining us. Uh, Dr. Dia is a cardiologist in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, uh, you know, uh, this is part of the work that she has been doing in novel tracers, uh, PET tracers in cardiac amyloidosis. So, um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll have a live discussion after. Thank you. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I actually was a cardiologist in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and then uh, moved to Columbia for amyloidosis fellowship with Dr. Marr, and then have stayed on faculty for over a year now. <laughs> Just I <lucky>. apologize. <laughs> uh, no worries, no worries. I used to be, though, in prior practice. Um, so, so I want to discuss this case that was published two months ago, and uh, I want to start by thanking um, every, all the authors on, on this paper. Um, and of course, many thanks to Dr. Marv for being a great mentor um, and Steve Helpke, who without him, nothing would happen in the lab. Um, okay, let's see here. So I wanted to you know, begin with a background uh, because as we know, cardiac amyloidosis has changed a lot for any of us, sorry, for any of us who have been in, in uh, cardiology for more than 10 years. So cardiac amyloidosis is a, uh, you know, 
progressive infiltrative um, cardiomyopathy is often overlooked and underdiagnosed in half puff. Um, it's increasingly that, you know, recognized mainly because we actually have better diagnostic imaging than over 10 years ago. And also we have a lot of novel therapies, which we did not have even five years ago. Um, but there's still an unmet need in imaging for the diagnosis of chronic amyloidosis. And more importantly, there's a huge unmet need for objective monitoring response to the treatment beyond subjective symptoms and physical uh, battery tests and uh, quality of life questionnaires. And it, honestly, it's still unclear what happens to the amyloid burden um, in the heart after treatment. So here we, I present to you um, a case of a 46-year-old um, Italian male with variant transthyretin amyloidosis due to the, glu, um, to the glutamate, uh, glutamic acid 109 glutamine variant. Um, the, the patient actually developed symptoms at age 37, um, which were mainly neurological and uh, actually had an EMG and further neurological evaluation at age 39, uh, which showed uh, neuropathy. Um, he even underwent skin biopsies, which actually showed um, amyloidosis infiltration, as well as uh, decrease um, in uh, epidermal um, nerve, nerve density. Um, just to uh, cover what this mutation is, obviously we know that there's over 30 mutations um, and we still, you know, we still know there's more and there's some that are not actually, uh, you know, um, defined in terms of uh, phenotype. Uh, then this sequence, um, you know, the sequence change replaces glutamic acid with glutamine at codon 109 of the, of the transthyretin protein. And this, this variant is actually associated with both cardiomyopathy and uh, neuropathy and prevalent in Italy and Bulgaria. So at this time, the patient did not have any cardiac symptoms. Um, all his cardiac enzymes were normal, um, and also his pre-albumin level was normal. Um, SFUFAP um, and ear light chains were also normal. So he did, uh, you know, get an echo at that time, um, and the echo showed preserved LV function, and um, you know, septal and posterior wall were mildly increased at 1.3 centimeters, and global longitudinal strain was also um, decreased at negative 14 percent was more negative than negative 20 being considered normal. And as you can see, there's also septal sparing, I mean, uh, sorry, apical sparing um, on the global on strain. He also got a uh, technetium pyrophosphate scan. And at that time we were at Columbia, we were performing uh, the scans after one hour uh, post radio tracer injection. Um, and as you can see, it's obvious that there's, this is a perigene three score, very positive. And we did do SPECT without CT at that time. And so you can see there's uptake in the myocardium for sure. There's no doubt about it. So this, this time the patient was actually started on therapy. He was started on uh, deflunazole, which is a stabilizer. It's also an anti-inflammatory because at that time Tefamis was not FDA approved yet. And he was on deflunazole for four months. And then uh, fortunately for him, he was recruited um, and enrolled in the HELOS A trial. Uh, briefly, this was um, you know a trial that um, looked at the efficacy and safety of the TTR um, uh, in, in patients with neuropathy. So after he was on treatment for about 17 months, about, you know, four months of the stabilizers therapy, and then he was, uh, you know, he was in the trial with vetusiram, there's really no change in the echo uh, parameters. Um, and also his uh, global on strain also was stable. It was, um, you know, estimated at negative 14.8%. So remember the first one before treatment was negative 14%. He, but he also did undergo another PYP scan, um, which actually showed a grade one perigene score. So as you can see, there's not a lot of uptake, but there's something. Um, and also the, you know, HCL ratio is lower, but more importantly, this time we did get spec CT with, a, here's a CT, but you can see that there's no myocardial uptake of, the, of PYP and, and you can't see it on the CT as well. So he actually had improvement in his PYP scan and in his head, the patient thought he was amyloid free. We didn't believe that, of course. I think a lot of us don't believe that still, but um, the patient was enrolled in our palace study at our institution and under underwent PET CT imaging using a novel radio, um, uh, ra you know, radioactive uh, peptide, I-124 avistamide, made by a trialist in San Francisco. Um, and this is actually um, designed to be an amyloidosis specific imaging agent capable of detecting all amyloid types in Q organs. In our pilot study, we want to evaluate the utility of this radio tracer uh, using PET scanning for the, for the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, but also determine the extent of extra cardiac involvement in patients who had it. Uh, PET images were acquired from the skull base uh, to the thighs at five minute bed positions, but we spent an extra 20 minutes for cardiac acquisition 
given that uh, you know we had low counts in general, since it's a uh, it's only one millicurie that the patients get, uh, you know, for better images. This this actually shows the PET CT images. So you here you see um, you know sagittal coronal uh, and transaxial images, both in black and white, um, and this color scheme. And you can see that there's actually diffuse uptake um, of the ray tracer. This is actually, of course, after the negative PYP. Um, and, you know, mainly in the LV and the septum, but also a little bit in the RV and the interatrial um, septum as well over here. So, you know, how could that happen? Well, we know that we we saw this before. So, um, you know, the results of the Apollo B trial, um, you know, which evaluated Petisteran in in, car in transthyretin in carbamazepine, were presented almost a year ago. Um, and in this trial, cardiac uptake um, on, on PYP uh, or bone centric in, in general was assessed in a subset of patients at, at uh, baseline and also at 12 months after initiation of, of therapy. All subjects in the FTCRN arm had reduced or no change in the perigene grading scale at uh, month 12 relative to baseline, and the placebo patients demonstrated uh, no reduction from baseline uh, and at, at 12, YP, uh, you know, 12 month PYP scans. Of, of those patients in the FTCRN arm, Almost 40% demonstrated reduction of greater than one per genetic grade score, including three patients that actually reduced their score from uh, more than two points uh, to a normal uh, a scan at 12 months. And this finding on, on transtheritin silence therapy in Apollo B was interesting, but it was unclear whether the improvement in per genetic grades represented a decrease in amyloid microbial burden uh, and is associated with improvement in cardiac structure or function. We still don't know. Uh, but you know, there was a recent analysis in the last year of a bone avid tracer uh, technician 99 DPT. Um, and, you know, there is, there's still theories about what uh, these avid, you know, bone tracers actually bind to. But in that study, uh, the, the, trace, the, the um, uh, tracer actually bound to areas of microcalcification on histopathology, but not amyloid. We know for sure it's not amyloid. Um, this suggests that surrogate markers of transthyretin amyloid with scintigraphy should not be used as a measure for, uh, of the amount of amyloid. So qualitative is fine, but not quantitative. Uh, the, these findings also raise concerns about the use of changes in both scintigraphy as a secondary or exploratory endpoint in ongoing clinical trials or novel therapies for uh, transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. In this case, PET-CT imaging using this novel UAE tracer showed significant cardiac uptake despite a negative uh, technician PYP scan and no changes in echo parameters including straight imaging, highlighting potential discrepancies between <clears throat> imaging approaches and the need for further research. This case also demonstrates that PET imaging using I-124 evistamide may still detect cardiac amyloidosis in a patient on TTR silencer therapy when technician PYP scanning is no longer positive, and the potential role for PET imaging to monitor disease progression with therapy or hopefully regression. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. This is phenomenal. It highlights the fact that, you know, you have to make sure that you know what your imaging is actually imaging. And diagnosis does not equate longitudinal follow-up always and whatnot. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Malhotra to uh, see what comments he has and if he has any questions. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Dina, great case. Um, and congratulations on your publication. Um, uh, you Thank know, you. Uh, your experience in sharing that is definitely advancing the field is uh, so much more for us to learn and uh, know in amyloid. Uh, you know, I, uh, I want to highlight some very peculiar aspects of the case, um, you know, um, which uh, I know it, it, uh, it's an uh, imaging focused uh, case, but uh, from a clinical standpoint, even though your patient had marked PYP uptake, he was at least from your presentation, asymptomatic from a cardiac amyloid standpoint. So this would, we would call this as a subclinical cardiac amyloid patient, even though there is um, evidence of uh, uh, PYP uptake, abnormal strain, uh, reduced injection fraction, although the uh, component is negative, BNP is normal. So from a, from a clinical standpoint, the patient is really not having symptoms of cardiac amyloidosis. He does have, definitely has cardiac amyloid deposits. Um, a uh, patient had mild LVH, uh, and I think that's important to remember too. We are often fixated on the fact that if you don't see moderate to severe LVH, uh, the patient cannot or should not be thought of as having cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and again, and I, I did some rough mathematics. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the first strain really met the one cutoff for apical sparing, and I've 
I often see this in some of our amyloid patients that they really don't have that um, apical sparing cutoff of one, but their pattern on strain imaging looks as if the apex is better. And I think that is also important to remember in this case. And I think all of that may just point to the fact that this patient is um, relatively early in the disease as compared to maybe other patients who may present with uh, symptomatic cardiac amyloid. And then of course, your use of one hour imaging. My question on that is, are you still using one hour imaging? Because that is, uh, has been a contentious topic and Dr. Masri's published on that. And so have I, and uh, just want to know what Columbia is doing uh, and, uh, and from, from a standpoint of uh, timing of imaging uh, in, uh, in their patients. No, absolutely. Very good points. Um, we actually are doing three-hour imaging. I think they switched almost four years ago now. Um, they added SPECT also four years ago and SPECT CT two years ago. Um, I, I should point out it was actually in the case that was published, but this patient was lucky because his mom had the same genetic variant. His brother also has the same genetic variant. So he actually was, was diagnosed almost 10 years with the gene variant before he had neuropathy even. So he's definitely early, but this is a patient that I would have missed, I would have missed in practice when I was in private practice because I, I practiced for almost five years in private practice as a general cardiologist in Georgia. And I'm pretty sure I missed all these patients because I, I did not know these patients presented that early. Um, I did not know that you can actually have cardiomyopathy before neuropathy in these patients. And I think, I think we're still trying to figure all this out, but I, I think this case highlights that a very small amount of people in cardiology actually know how to diagnose this, especially variant cardiac amyloidosis and treat it. And actually that's one of the reasons why I went back and did the fellowship with Dr. Moore. I didn't know what I didn't know. That's a good point. Yeah, your experience um, uh, coming from practice and going and doing the amyloid fellowship, what do you, what do you think uh, now would have ticked you off in terms of uh, a patient such as this presenting to your practice having cardiac amyloid? I and mean, what would you tell our uh, audience and say, okay, this is, this is what I did not know, but this is, this is one or a few things that in this patient that I, that I would have, uh, that would make me now think that this patient has cardiac amyloid. No, that's, that's yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm a totally different person after I did this fellowship. Now I'm like, uh, I've been a, uh, attending now for over a year. And I can tell you, number one, never ignore LVH. Um, you know, we always attribute to hypertension. You know, I can tell you that if anything, this patient never had hypertension, he has orthostasis. But again, you know, we just assume at some point they may have had hypertension. You know, any LVH needs to be evaluated. You need to have a reason for it. I actually, the only reason why I don't think I missed a lot of amyloidosis patients in, in, in Georgia is because I actually, as an imager, I sent everyone with LVH for MRI. I want to make sure I was, first of all, also just to see if they have a lot of scar, but especially the patients with VT, but also just to make sure I'm not missing any HOCAM patients or, you know, there are patients that present a little bit differently on echo. Um, so, you know, never ignore LVH. Uh, it needs to be explained. Number two is very, very importantly, to take a really good family history. And um, also, you know, asking the patients about symptoms of both neuro neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. So if there's any suspicion, especially if they, you know, have orthostatic symptoms, they have a family history of heart failure, especially uh, their parents having it at a young age, you need to suspect this as a diagnosis. Um, now, do you need to do a PYP scan on everyone? No, but in patients who, you know, for example, normalization of hypertension is never normal, you know, unless you lose a lot of weight, you know, there's something going on. Number two is, you know, uh, patients who, where the, the EKG doesn't match the echo findings, right? Like if you have LVH on, on, on echo and they're not obese and, you know, you have to explain it. Is it a fusion? Is it because there's conduction disease? You know, I mean, what's going on, right? So it's usually infiltrative. Um, so I think any mismatch in, in terms of the echo, MRI, or EKG needs to be investigated. What I can tell you is before I did the fellowship, I just didn't know how to even diagnose AL amyloidosis, even though I'm an imager, right? I, I knew, you know, it doesn't show up on PYP for the most part, but I didn't know like what to look for exactly. Um, so I, you know, and I can tell you, you know, uh, you know, I do work in other hospitals, community hospitals, and there's still a lot of misinformation. And most of the HFFs that keep on, you know, getting uh, readmitted are actually amyloidosis patients. Yeah, great points. Yeah, thank you. Um, one speculative question, um, and I'm sure you've prepared for this. <laughs> Why? How do you explain the discrepancy in the absence of PYP uptake and, uh, and uptake of ATO1? So absolutely. So there's a lot of theories. We still don't know. Um, part of it is because PET imaging with any radio tracer is still in the research phase. And 
we're actually working on uh, following some of those patients that we scanned. We actually just finished scanning 25 patients and we're gonna, we put 10 patients on silencer and or stabilizer therapy and we're gonna follow them um, with the same imaging technique to see if there's any change. I can tell you other people are working as well. We, we don't know, but one of the main theories is number one, maybe there's less amyloid, right? Which again, we haven't proven yet. Number two is the structure of amyloid actually changes. So we know that PYP does not uh, bind to amyloid. In fact, there are certain genetic variants where it doesn't, uh, it's not positive at all. It doesn't bind to the amyloid at all. So it's something in the structure, maybe, you know, the longer the amyloid is there, there's more calcifications. We really don't know. Uh, number three is maybe because now you're making less amyloid because you're silencing it or stabilizing it or both, that there's a equilibrium where some of it falls off, right? And so maybe it's because you're not building more amyloid. So we really don't know, but these are the theories currently. And I think, you know, we need more studies because even if you do a, a biopsy, unless you do, you, you evaluate the protein itself, you really can't figure out, you know, what's going on exactly. So we need the better PET imaging and, and, and follow-up imaging, right? For, to, to see response to therapy. Yeah, you know, we, we, we know from observational data that, um, again, selected cohorts, uh, up to 50% prevalence of amyloid on, on autopsy biopsies and uh, nanogenarians does that necessarily mean that they have amyloid dose this? Um, and applying the same analogy to your case, as you mentioned, you know, defeating them and stabilizing or halting the progression of disease resulted in a reduction of a burden to an extent that is not picked up by a P by P scan, and, but maybe picked up by a PET scan. I think what we really need to know is what is what does that correlate from a clinical standpoint and from what you're telling us the patient's been doing well from a cardiovascular standpoint thus far uh, so maybe the lack of pyp uptake or pyp imaging not picking up anything in the heart may not be such a bad thing but i think we really we need to know that um, in, in in future studies such as uh, what you're doing no, absolutely and uh, you know as far as this patient the only i guess the cardiac or, you know, sympathy, they're not really cardiac, symptoms, they're more neuropathy, is really orthostasis, rarely. Uh, but the patient never had heart failure, never had any, you know, issues with his heart, no arrhythmias. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting, actually. Um, but again, he was lucky that he was diagnosed early. I, I, I would add that we do have a patient in the study. So we actually had uh, 10 patients that had negative PYP scans that had positive PETs. Um, and some of them already had biopsies, so that's why we scanned them. Um, but some of them did not. So there's like three patients are, that still need to get a biopsy after the, after the testing because we need to, that's, that's what we need to get them medications. Um, but there is one patient that's actually on, he has a rare rare as well, but he has been on stabilizer and uh, silencer therapy now for three years, actually four years together. Um, I don't know how his insurance pays for both, but he, he's 65 and there's barely any amyloid there. And he actually, his, his biopsy showed a lot of amyloid over four years ago. So it'll be interesting to see, we, we're gonna scan him again. He's one of the 10 patients we're gonna scan um, a year, exactly a year after the first scan to see if there's any change. But that's really a really good point. Uh, Very interesting I, thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank Emma, you bye. both. This is a fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, Steve has joined us in the audience uh, uh, and is saying something really, I think key is that some of these patients, they have, um, you know, in a way suppression of their cardiac symptoms, they don't mm -hmm. appear because of their neuropathic manifestations, which is a really key point that we see a lot in practice. If you have polyneuropathy or if you have dysautonomia or if you're struggling to stand up or walk, you're not gonna really have dyspnea or chest pain or any of that stuff. And so that's really key. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Renee. All right, great. So this brings us to the end of our webinar. We had three fascinating cases ranging from congenital heart disease with truncal arteriosis. And then we also had a great case using advanced technologies with HCM. And then our final case, of course, with cardiac amyloidosis and PET imaging. So I'd like to thank our expert panel, um, all of um, our panelists, Dr. Ito, Dr. Love, Dr. Kramer, Dr. Malhotra, and of course, um, thanks to all the HA staff that have been working with us in the background to help to bring this production live. So with that, this ends, leads us to the end of our webinar, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.